Hi there. In this topic video, we're going to focus on introductory macroeconomics and in particular the concept of aggregate demand. So aggregate demand, it's a big number and it's a really important idea in macroeconomics. And aggregate, of course, just means total. In this case, we want to try and measure how much is being spent on goods and services by all consumers, businesses, the government and uh, people and firms overseas. So aggregate demand is the total level of planned real spending on goods and services produced within a country in a given time period. That's normally a year. Now, there's a formula for calculating the level of aggregate demand. Let's work our way through it. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's called C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So C, household spending, consumer spending on goods and services, also known as consumption. So this is demand for durable items, new computers, smartphones, vehicles, spending on food and drink, health and tourism. Consumer spending. Gross fixed capital investment spending or investment is spending by businesses and governments on capital goods, such as plant and equipment, technology, new buildings. These, of course, these capital goods allow us to produce more consumer goods in the future. So that's investment. We also include, by the way, the value of the change in stocks, stocks of components and finished products. That's called working capital, and that's lumped in into the investment number. So, so far, with aggregate demand, we have C, consumption, plus I, investment. Then we add in government spending on public services. And this is spending by the government on state-provided goods and services, such as public goods and merit goods. Our decisions on how much the government will spend each year are naturally affected by key developments in the economy and uh, political objectives, as well as population trends. So we have C plus I plus G, consumer spending plus investment plus government spending. Then we add in exports of goods and services. Exports, they're sold overseas and they're an inflow of aggregate demand, an injection into our circular flow of income and spending, adding to a nation's aggregate demand. The final bit of the equation is minus imports, minus M. Imports of goods and services are a withdrawal of demand, a leakage from a country's circular flow of income and spending. So we come to the equation that aggregate demand is C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Add those all together, we find an equation for aggregate demand or GDP based on expenditure, the actual value of spending on domestically produced goods and services. And once you have that equation firmly in your mind, then you're in a good place because changes in demand, if you like shifts in aggregate demand, are absolutely key to understanding the fluctuations we see in economic cycles. For example, how countries move from a slowdown to a recession, or how a country can emerge from a recession into a recovery period. Here's the, uh, the data on aggregate demand for the UK up to the end of 2014. C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And notice here that consumption on goods and services is far and away the biggest single component of aggregate demand. That's true for most countries, particularly high income nations, although not true for all. And we'll come to a separate topic video on China a little later. But consumption is the biggest single item Notice on the right hand side that for the UK, the value of exports is lower than the value of imports. X minus M is negative. That means the UK is operating a trade deficit and therefore that acts as a, as a drag or a reduction on the level of R, UK, aggregate demand. Here's the aggregate demand curve. The aggregate demand curve, if you're, if you're familiar with micro, just shows the relationship between the general price level and real national income. We'll do a separate topic video explaining why it's downward sloping. But for the moment, 
just uh, keep in mind that if the price level goes up, it's likely that aggregate demand will contract, partly because people have less real income. And if the price level goes down, it's possible that aggregate demand could expand for the opposite reason. Crucially, of course, in part of your macroeconomics, it's key to understand what causes shifts in aggregate demand. And again, we'll, cause, we'll look at this in more depth in another topic video. But AD1 shifting to AD2 is an outward shift of demand, whereas the aggregate demand curve shifting from AD1 to AD3 is an inward shift of aggregate demand. Now, what causes a fall or an inward shift in AD? Lots of reasons. Here are four. It could be the case there's been a, a reduction in our net exports. In other words, X has fallen or M imports has gone up. It might be because the government, in a period of fiscal austerity, is cutting its own spending. So G is falling. Or perhaps the central bank is lifting interest rates, having a dampening effect on consumer confidence and spending. And it could be the case that there's been a fall in household wealth, prompting people to spend less. Keep in mind that consumption is the biggest single item of, of aggregate demand. On the other hand, we could see a period when aggregate demand is expanding, it's increasing. There's a shift in total spending on goods and services. Again, lots of reasons why. Could have been a depreciation of the exchange rate, making exports more competitive in overseas markets. Perhaps the government has decided to cut a direct tax, such as income tax, or an indirect tax, such as VAT. Maybe we've seen an increase in the average level of house prices, causing consumer wealth and confidence to, to grow. Or perhaps on the monetary side of the economy, the cost of a loan has gone down or banks are more willing and able to lend out to, to businesses and households. Some of these factors would cause an outward shift of aggregate demand. Now, crucially, most countries are susceptible to external shocks. A shock is an unexpected event which triggers a second or third round response in demand, production and jobs. So any kind of unexpected event is called a shock. So for example, we can get sudden movements in the exchange rate affecting competitiveness and the prices of exports and imports. That will be an external shock. Uh, perhaps there has been an economic event in another country with whom we trade a significant amount. So a slowdown in China, for example, will have reverberations for aggregate demand in many countries. There may have been a, a particular slump in the construction sector or another industry of significance. In the UK at the moment, the steel industry is firmly in the news. And it could be the case we have a much more widespread, if you like, a systemic shock to an economy, such as the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, which of course, the effects of which of course are still with us today. And for countries that are major exporters of a particular commodity, one thinks, for example, of Angola, where 90% of exports come from oil, or Zambia, where over 60% of exports come from copper. Think of those types of countries. Uh, a big change in the commodity price of a major export is going to have clearly a significant effect on your aggregate demand in the short term. So the point from this slide is that uh, all countries are susceptible to or vulnerable to external shocks which will affect the level of aggregate demand. Okay, there's so much more to cover on this topic, but what we've done today is introduce you to the idea of aggregate demand and we've looked at the formula for measuring it. We've made a distinction between an outward and an inward shift of aggregate demand and we've just touched on some of the external factors, some of the external shocks that can affect aggregate demand in developed and emerging developing economies. Thanks for logging into this one. Hope to see you again on more topic videos.